Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's your host, Danny Haifong, for another live stream. As you can see, I am joined by two very special guests returning to the program. We have Professor Ken Hammond, who uh, is a professor at New Mexico State University and an activist for Pivot to Peace. And we have Carlos Martinez, co-editor of Friends of Socialist China, co-founder of No Cold War. He's on the coordinating committee of International Manifesto Group. And both have just published two books this year on China. Uh, Carlos Martinez has published The East is Still Red, Chinese Socialism in the 21st Century. And Ken Hammond published China's Revolution in the Quest for a Socialist Future. You can find those books in the links in the description, both from their publishers. So with all that said, welcome. Good to be with both of you again. How are you two doing? Very glad to be here. Doing good. Thank right. you. Great to be with you guys. Great, great, great. So you know what to do, everyone. Please hit that like button. It helps get more viewers into the stream. Share, of course. Subscribe to the channel. And do check out all the links in the video description for how to support this program. So. I want to first ask you two about what's kind of been the talk of the town in the mainstream Western media, which is the release of the Huawei Mate 60 Pro. And Bloomberg, Washington Post are all framing this as kind of a cause for alarm in regards to how effective are U.S. sanctions working? Because Huawei has been sanctioned by the United States since 2019. And these sanctions were deemed to be quite effective, especially in the beginning. And I was just in China and some folks were telling me that they did have an impact on Huawei's ability to produce phones. I think their model before this one couldn't even have 5G technology because of the export ban on semiconductors in line, you know, in, in parallel with these sanctions. But now Huawei has come out with this new phone and the big concern is that it's made in China, that all of the components, the parts are made in China. So 
What do you make of this? And uh, whoever wants to begin, uh, maybe we can start with Carlos. Uh, what do you make of this? Uh, where did where? How do you see this playing out? Like, why has this happened? Uh, given that there's supposed to be this ultra effective tech war on China, and uh, uh, yet we're seeing kind of different results at the moment from what we were, I think, supposed to be seeing um, all along. So I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, you know, the whole thing is like a manifestation of the total confusion and incoherence in US policy. You know, the US is desperate to stop China's development, to prevent its rise, to hold on to US hegemony. And that's been a bipartisan position that doesn't start with Biden. It doesn't start with, start with Trump. Actually, it starts, uh, if anything, with Obama, with 2011, with Hillary Clinton, the pivot to Asia, and so on. Um, that obviously escalated under Trump and hasn't got any better under Biden. In fact, in many ways, it's got significantly worse under Biden. So the US said that it was going to stop selling semiconductors to China. It was going to impose tariffs on Chinese imports. It was going to impede Chinese investment in US businesses and so on. And it's really, you know, a couple of people have made this point, but it's a kind of quintessential example of what Mao Zedong referred to as lifting a rock only to drop it on one's own feet. Like, China's by far the world's largest market for semiconductors. So you stop selling to China and U.S. companies are going to see a major drop in their revenue. Actually, it's not just U.S. companies because they're forcing this madness on their so-called allies in Europe, in you know the Netherlands, in South Korea, um, in Japan and so on. And a major drop in revenues means that they then see a major drop in their research and development spending, which means that they are, are going to end up falling behind China, right? Like the Chinese have released this new, the Huawei Mate 60 Pro, as you said, it's the first high-end 5G enabled smartphone that's been made in China with domestically produced chips. We don't have too many details at the moment, but it looks like the chip has been produced or provided by SMIC, which is, which is China's biggest uh, semiconductor company, state-owned company, and presumably not a coincidence that the phone was announced during Raimondo's visit. And it reflects incredibly fast progress. Like these sanctions were introduced in late 2020. So it's two and a half years later. At the time, you had politicians and journalists saying, well, that's it for China. You know, we've stopped their semiconductor development. They're decades behind. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring China's 5G rollout to a grinding halt. Actually... It was the US chip makers, it was NVIDIA and others who was, and Intel and others that were saying, mm, we're not sure about this. A, we don't want to lose the Chinese market. B, we're not really convinced the sanctions are going to work. That's probably just going to motivate China to become a chip superpower in its own right. And they've been proven right. Like China's catching up. China's throwing a lot at this project and China's got the resources. China's economy is obviously structured in a way that they can throw enormous resources at critically important projects like catching up with the US in, in, in semiconductors, in chips, in advanced computer technology, um, and not having their development suppressed and not falling prey to this economic containment and economic coercion program. So I think ultimately it's just another data point showing that the US's new Cold War which has propaganda elements and diplomatic elements and sanctions elements and economic elements isn't working. Yeah, Ken, do you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I of course, I agree with uh, with what Carlos has said, and I think that that uh, you know the the sort of larger lesson to draw from well, there's kind of two ways in which we can draw larger lessons from this particular episode. Um, one being exactly as Carlos was saying, that China's going to press ahead. China's going to, you know, the, the, the reconfiguration of global economic relations and China's development within that context. This is not something that's going to be, you know, halted or derailed uh, by American sanctions or tariffs or any of this stuff. This, it's, that's, it's just not going to work um, because, uh, you know, China's uh, got this economy that has uh, it's got a, a market uh, uh, it has market characteristics, but it is still a socialist economy with the ability of, uh, of the government to direct resources in areas that are that are considered to be uh, important. 
and uh, and they have given clear priority to trying to to develop their their chip industry. Uh, there's been massive investment, massive research and development going on, and this is just one example uh, of the fruit of that of that endeavor. So. What the United States is doing, and, and Carlos's invocation, your invocation of, of Mao's quote is perfect, is, uh, you know, putting obstacles in China's path, uh, which will not uh, ultimately achieve their, their stated objective, uh, but which will cause China to have to work a little harder, uh, be something that they're going to have to overcome these difficulties. But in the end, China has the determination and the capability to do that. So the net effect will simply be to further alienate uh, the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, and, and for some in America, some of the politicians and others in America, that's probably seen as a, as a desirable outcome in its own right. But it's an unfortunate outcome in terms of both uh, China's ability to, to pursue its own course of development and for the American people, because it, it you know, it, it drives a, a wedge between people who ought to be uh, working together uh, to solve, you know, much bigger existential problems uh, uh, with the environment and, and the future of the planet and such, uh, rather than getting bogged down in this kind of uh, really fruitless and, and, and in many ways self-defeating uh, effort to, to, to thwart uh, China's reemergence. Yeah, and I wanted to point to, uh, Carlos, you mentioned uh, Gina Raimondo. She was in China when this was released. I believe it was the tail end of her visit at the end of August, early September. So the timing is very also almost perfect. And there wasn't really a lot of buildup. It's, it's not like in the United States when a new iPhone is coming out and you get weeks and weeks, perhaps months and months and months of buildup. The new iPhone is coming. It's coming. It wasn't like that at all. Um, and in fact, after it, it, Ramondo came back, she was going around the Western media. She went on Face the Nation on CBS and she immediately after a productive meeting, she had a lot of good things to say about the meeting right after it happened. But as she started to make the rounds in Western mainstream media, she went to face the nation on CBS and said that China was the one making things difficult in the world, the business environment. And she said that the U.S. and the U.S. business climate in particular is losing its patience with China. And so I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about this? Like, how, how do you because it seems like there's a pattern here of the United States. Uh, scheduling these visits, going uh, to China to speak with high level officials in various areas, e economic, diplomatic, and then coming back and <laughs> kind of undoing all of the maybe goodwill and diplomacy that might have been engaged in. We don't know what happens behind closed doors, but generally both sides come out relatively uh, more happier than they were before until the United States and its officials start talking again and start doing again. So what do you make of this, Carlos? Yeah, you know, I think that's exactly right. And, and they don't always wait for the US officials to come back before they ruin the whole thing, you know? <laughs> and, and it's really, it's very typical of US interactions with China over the last year, at least. Very similar to Anthony Blinken, who went to Beijing in June, had what seemed like a very productive meeting. Um, and then I think before he even came back, Biden at, so, you know, gave some or other speech, engaging in a completely stupid provocation, like so completely undi undiplomatic and unnecessary and foolish, calling uh, Xi Jinping a dictator. And it meant that any goodwill that had been generated by the visit was just immediately thrown in the dustbin. So you've got Raimondo going there on a four day visit, Everyone was happy, everyone was enthusiastic. Raimondo herself said that it was had been successful and it had been productive. And the Chinese were very enthusiastic as well. You know, if you read Global Times or CGTN or China Daily, they praised her for behaving um, with, I think the expression was impressive pragmatism. And, you know, the two sides made various agreements. They're gonna set up a working group to manage commercial issues and all the rest of it. Then the minute she gets back to the US, she does this interview with CNN. She says, yes, US chip exports, um, the ban on chip exports is correct. It's the best thing ever. It's gonna be maintained. It's gonna be escalated. China isn't a positive environment for US businesses. China's making things difficult for us. 
and so on. And as you said, you know, with the with the spy balloon incident as well, um, which was another major thing of impeding what seemed like was a trajectory of improvement of relations between the two countries, there's a pattern here and it's happened enough times that it's very obviously not a coincidence. And as I said earlier, you know, it just reflects this ongoing total confusion and incoherence in US policy, where US business, you know, the business community is calling out for good relations with China. US capitalism needs the Chinese market, you know, the much vaunted middle income population of 500 million people um, that, that could be great for US uh, manufacturing and advanced industry. Um, the US needs Chinese investment, the US needs trade, the US needs China to continue with its holding of, um, of treasury reserves and so on. So China plays an extremely important role in the global economy and the US business community recognizes that. But on the other hand, you've got US strategists, both Democratic and Republican, they've got a bipartisan consensus which is for a new Cold War, which is for containment, which is for encirclement, uh, which is for essentially a project for a new American century, which even though it's a, a, a phrase, it's a slogan, it's a project, a label that's um, associated with Republican neocons, it's consensus, you know, it's Biden, it's Trump, it's Obama, it's George W. Bush. Um, and even though it's a it's a failed project, you know, it's a project that's failed before it even started. They can't let go of it. They can't think of any other way. So it just gives rise to this massive confusion, this massive incoherence. And I think at some point, the Chinese are going to tire of it and realize that these people are simply not reliable partners in discussion and dialogue and cooperation. I think that's exactly right again. Uh, and I think that, that uh, it, you know, it's, it, it, we can characterize it as as confused. It's also, in, in some ways, I, I sometimes think of it as kind of schizophrenic in the sense that, that you know, on one day, one thing is said and done, and then the very next day, exactly the opposite is said and done. You know, that uh, we make these, we make these commitments, we make these statements, uh, we send uh, diplomats over there, uh, and, and then uh, you know, then the very next day, there's a press release about more arms sales, more giveaways of weapons to Taiwan. Uh, the American ambassador uh, in uh, Japan just made a, a terrible speech, uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, you know, attacking China, blaming China for the world's all the world's ills, you know, basically come uh, uh, come due uh, to actions uh, uh, of China. And, and it, it's, it's not um, there's no consistency other than. Uh, the the appeal that politicians are making to American people, uh, you know, we're one of the sad things here, of course, is that we're in a perpetual uh, electoral cycle and politicians are always, uh, you know, looking over their shoulders at, at the, 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 the polls and the, the sound bites and this kind of stuff. And they're just competing uh, with increasing recklessness to see who can sound tougher, who can talk the hardest about about China, who can make the greatest threats about China uh, for a domestic audience. And it's not a domestic audience that even wants to hear that. Uh, but this is what the politicians, you know, they're trying to reshape American attitude to prepare the American people to, you know, to accept whatever antagonistic actions go on between the United States and China, because it's certainly not in the in the actual practical interests of ordinary Americans to have this antagonism, to have this disruption in the relationship and potentially uh, to have very serious uh, uh, disruption. If actual hostilities were to break out, uh, that would have a devastating effect upon the American economy and, 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 and really do serious damage to ordinary people. But the politicians are are incapable, uh, and I think that's exactly uh, right, Carlos. That that they're unable, uh, they they can't they can't break out of this. Whether it's a Cold War mentality or or a New American Century mentality, whatever it is, uh, they can't break out of it. It's 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 just such a such a mental universe that they that they live within. I wanted to maybe if we if we wanted to close on on this question of the of the tech war on China, like how has China done this? Because this is just one example, even the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, who, which I know both of you know, and I'm sure 
the audience here know something about this uh, State Department, uh, military contractor funded Australian think tank that is huge in the propaganda war. It's admitted, and I pull this up a lot, I talk about its uh, technology tracker that it has. It's admitted that China has surpassed the United States and is leading the world in 37 of the 44 advanced technologies in the world and that that lead is only growing the gap between each category and as well as the places where China is falling has has been behind and I think this phone in and of itself shows that even in these areas where for example like advanced chip production where China may be a little bit behind it's catching up and so I'm wondering, how has it done this? Some will say it's because the sanctions have backfired. I think there's an element to that, but there might be more to it, too. So, uh, Carlos, do you want to begin? Sure. I mean, yeah, uh, san the sanctions have backfired, uh, as sanctions often do backfire. Um, sanctions against Russia have very manifestly backfired. And the the impact that they've had on the Russian economy is like, infinitesimally small if you compare to the impact on the European economy, uh, where, you know, in Britain, in the EU, in Germany, in France, the economy is seriously suffering, you know, a cost of living crisis, an inflation crisis, as a result of, you know, a direct result of these sanctions that the US has forced these countries to impose on Russia. The, the sanctions on China are definitely backfiring because they have fermented, you know, there's, there's a reason China is pursuing this level of kind of technological autonomy that it didn't feel the need to pursue up until the last few years is China realizes that it's going to be under attack. China realizes that the US is trying to lead an, an economic and a scientific and a technological siege. And China can't accept that. China can't accept that for its own population, 1.4 billion people in a developing country who've come to expect that they're going to live better than previous generations and they've got the right to live better you know why should uh why should china be stuck where the us wants it at the bottom of global value chains for 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 eternity they don't accept that and they're never, never going to accept that and they were always clear that they were never going to accept that so there has been an element of china has been spurred by us aggression to develop its own technologies and to develop more autonomy, more self-reliance. You know, ideologically, in terms of their understanding of economics, um, Chinese are big fans, big proponents of globalization, big fans of, of supply chain efficiencies, big proponents of, you know, um, division of labor and, and integrated supply chains. So they're not the ones that have instigated this conflict. They're not the ones that have instigated the whole idea of decoupling or de-risking or whatever you want to call it. Um, but they 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 have responded to US aggression and US hostility and US sanctions in a very direct way and a very clear way. The other thing is, you know, I've, it's kind of maybe seems a little bit trite to say it for, for those of us, the, uh, those, those among the audience that are familiar with what I write, with what Ken writes, with what Danny writes. But China is a socialist country, and the uh, as a workers' state or a people's state, it's able to control the levers of the economy in a way that capitalist countries, and especially capitalist countries that have been floundering under neoliberal strategy for the last forty years, can't. You know, the fact that the China's big four banks are state-owned means that resources can be allocated in accordance with a plan, in accordance with what the government wants, what the people demand. Um, and that's very powerful. You know, uh, Huawei is not a state-owned company, but it works very closely with the government. It works very closely with the Communist Party of China. SMIC is a state-owned company. So without this kind of ferocious and relentless short-termism short -termism and opportunism of neoliberal capitalism, China is free to actually organize its economy on a medium and long-term basis. Um, and that's able to produce results. And that's why it's China that's, that's able to break out of these sanctions and catch up with the US, catch up with the West in terms of semiconductor technology. That's why it's China that's leading on renewable energy. That's why it's China that's increasingly uh, leading on 
space exploration, supercomputing, um, telecoms, advanced infrastructure, advanced industry, and so on. You know, it comes down to a, a very simple point and perhaps a trite one, but nonetheless important. It's it's about socialism. Yeah, I think that uh, that that's that's very much on, uh, to the point. And, and it's also about, again, uh, as you say, sort of long-termism, thinking in a longer time frame. Um, and, and the process of building socialism, you know, when, when China embarked upon the, the, the period of reform in which we still find ourselves, uh, you know, the, the objective was to, to use market mechanisms to develop the economy. And, and that's exactly what they have done. They set out to... Uh, to grow their economy, to, to uh, not just attract investment and, and sort of be producing goods, but to develop. And I think that that's a really, we need to take that word uh, very, very seriously. And so that has involved, again, because of having the socialist core, because of having, you know, the leadership of the Communist Party. Um, they, it's not just been this sort of haphazard, chaotic development of, of markets by themselves, but it has had, uh, there's been a guiding plan, a guiding consciousness, which has been able, as success has been achieved, to, to use the fruits of this process of development uh, in, in directed ways, in ways that are going to make a difference. Some of which, of course, has been just the basic uh, socialist objectives, human objectives of lifting, you know, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty creating a healthcare system, creating an education system for, for everyone, but also uh, to, to be able to, to uh, you know, think about where resources should be directed and to be able to, to focus uh, these developmental, these further developmental stages in ways that, that a capitalist system simply cannot do. It can't, it, you know, the, the, it's, it's both the, the short-termism uh, you know, always looking at at the quarterly statement and the bottom line and all that, and it's it, it's it's the chaos of competition. You know, uh, which is not to say that there aren't competitive elements in the Chinese economy. There certainly are, but they're not. That's not what rules the economy. The Chinese economy is still uh, guided at at the least, and of course the the, the state sectors are are planned. Uh, you know, there's there's still the ability of the leadership in the economy and in the government and, and via the party to, to, to think about what they're doing and to pursue these objectives. And as that has worked and as, you know, a, a sort, of, sort of social capital, if you will, has been accumulated, they have the resources and they have the capacity to direct those resources to achieve both social outcomes like ending poverty and economic outcomes comes like creativity and innovation so that they can overcome even the kinds of, of you know, pointless but, but serious obstacles put in their path by antagonistic forces like the United States. Yeah, no, all of these are such good points. I mean, you can, if you read Chinese media, you, the reports are all the time that, you know, at all levels of the Chinese government, there's a huge emphasis on developing the private sector, on... Uh, putting more investment, more energy into spurring this kind of innovation. I mean, Huawei is Huawei's new phone. I mean, it's not a cheap phone. Like you go, yeah, you're you're going to be paying close to market rate. Yet a lot of people are buying it, and still living standards are rising. That it, you know, you, we hear a lot also of deflation now with regard to China. Well, inflation is rampant across the West, especially in the United States and Europe, and uh, living standards are declining. So it is a much different dynamic occurring. And I wanted to point now to the uh, uh, many developments, but all of them kind of signaling a, a regional strategy among the uh, from the United States toward China in terms of diplomatic and military aggression. So Wang Yi a couple of days ago said that uh, nations in Asia should be cautious in creating a repeat Ukraine scenario where uh, they are galvanized to essentially fight a U.S. proxy war. I mean, this comes after so many developments, the trilateral summit uh, earlier in August, 
around the last couple of weeks of August, where Biden met at Camp David with South Korea's president, Japan's president, in order to strengthen their military ties, ostensibly against China, as well as the DPRK. Then you also had the Fukushima disaster happening right after that, where Japan was basically given carte blanche to release its radioactive waste from uh, that uh, nuclear meltdown that happened there in 2011. And of course, you also have more provocations in Taiwan, not just this FMF, a very a small sum relatively if we look at Ukraine, but still $85 million through a program meant for sovereign states, the FMF program through the State Department. And now there are reports, and this has not been uh, taken too seriously, but I think it is quite serious, reports of that the National Guard earlier this summer was training troops from Taiwan in Michigan. Uh, so with all of this put together points to, I think, a dangerous aggression. I'm wondering if you wanted to uh, comment on it and couch it in the, the context that I think it needs to be placed in. And we can start with Carlos. We're, I think we got that going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we were saying a bit earlier that it's kind of increasingly clear, it's increasingly obvious to everyone that this new Cold War isn't really working very well. Like you're supposed to be suppressing China. You're supposed to be containing China. You're supposed to be preventing its rise. You're supposed to be stopping the emergence of a multipolar world. The multipolar world is doing well. Like, the, you know, we can see from the BRICS summit, for example, and the expansion of BRICS, um, multipolar world is thriving. We've got a trajectory there. China's economy is doing relatively well. Like Chinese uh, GDP growth is around 5% per year which in Chinese terms, if you compare it to 10 years ago, it's low, but it's extremely healthy if you compare it to Britain or if you compare it to Germany or if you compare it to the IMF and the World, Bank, World Bank's predictions for the UN, United States this year, uh, which are that it's basically teetering on the brink of recession. And I mean, Danny, you and I went on the same trip to China um, to Beijing and Xi'an and other places in December 2019. And coincidentally, we were in Beijing at the same time just a couple of months ago. And even in that short time period of, of three years, and, and even given that you know, like COVID took place in between those times, you can see China's doing well, like living conditions continue to improve in China. Beijing looks more thriving than it was when I was last there. Guangzhou looks more thriving than it was when I was last there. And people are confident. People feel like they're earning more. Their yuan goes further than it used to. That the, the, the policies of common prosperity and leveling up are, around the country and trying to reduce inequality between regions, between social groups. That's, you know, the, those things are working. Those are projects that are in process, right? So in terms of suppressing China's economic development, it's clear that the new Cold War isn't going very well. Meanwhile, China is the largest trading partner of two thirds of the countries in the world. Um, about 150 countries have have signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative in some way. We've, we've discussed what's going on with semiconductors and, and chip technology. Renewable energy, China's responsible for literally like more than half global renewable investment. Um, there's huge enthusiasm for BRICS. Uh, you, we've got six countries that have been announced that will be joining uh, on, on the 1st of January next year. We've got 20 more countries that have applied to join, 20 more countries that have expressed an interest in joining. Meanwhile, China-Russia relationship is experiencing a golden era like China-Russia relations are probably better than they've been at any point since. I'm going to say, you know, Ken would have a be able to pin a date on this better than I can, <laughs> but you know, the, the mid to late 1950s. Yeah. So the Cold War is not working, but the motivation behind the Cold War is the same as it was, right? You know, that 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 motivation remains for maintaining U.S. hegemony, the project for new American century, as we've talked about, the idea of preventing China's rise preventing the collapse of this kind of US imperialist structure and system and the collapse of the neoliberal ideology that goes along with it, preventing China's emergence as a major player in world events, preventing the emergence of a multipolar world that, you know, doesn't sing to the tune 
of US capital. So if the Cold War is not working, but we the motivation for it is still there, what's the option that's left on the table? It's hot war, you know, it's a campaign of military encirclement of China with a view ultimately to, to suppressing China and best case scenario, uh, engaging in a war of regime change and undoing and dismantling the Chinese revolution. And, you know, this idea of China encirclement certainly isn't a new thing. Uh, it starts with, with, you know, with the victory of the Chinese revolution and the founding of the People's Republic. It starts in 1949. Um, escalated very quickly under the Truman regime with uh, the passage of the Seventh Fleet of the US Navy to the Taiwan Straits to prevent China's reunification. Then, you know, um, the encirclement of China and of the Soviet Union had a major role in, in the rationale for the Korean War, the island chain strategy, the stationing of literally tens of thousands of troops in Japan, in um, South Korea, in Okinawa, in Guam, along with lethal weaponry um, and nuclear-enabled missiles. Um, and this is being ramped up now in the modern era, like from the pivot to Asia onwards, there's been a shift of troops, particularly from the Middle East to the Pacific region. There's a new military base that the US has built in Darwin in North Australia. There's been the development and stationing of this third so-called missile defense system in South Korea and in Guam. Under Trump, you had the reactivation of the, the quad, the quadrilateral security dialogue. Under Biden, things are really kind of going from bad to worse in a way that I personally didn't expect. Um, the initiation of AUKUS, this uh, recent Camp David summit that you mentioned, Danny, where they're trying to bring the US, South Korea and Japan together in essentially in an anti-China military pact. You've got increased freedom of navigation assertions in the South China Sea. You've got increased arms sales to Taiwan, military aid, direct military aid to Taiwan for the first time. Um, you've got a, a kind of a system of, of pressure on China that is designed to obviously kind of dissipate Chinese forces and improve the US position in the event of a war, which would almost certainly have Taiwan as its trigger. Biden said multiple times, against US stated policy, against international law, against the, the very kind of basic conventions of the United Nations and against US policy of the one China principle, which has been in place for 50 years, um, that the US would intervene in the case of China, uh, mainland China attempting to reunify the country by force. Now, China said multiple times that it's got no intention of using force, but it does reserve the right to do so in the case of unilateral actions towards independence within Taiwan or outside interference towards independence. So what's the US doing? It's encouraging separatists in Taiwan and it's heavily interfering itself and it's trying to provoke an armed conflict. You know, just a few days ago, you had Carl Thomas, who is um, Vice Admiral, I think, in the, the Navy 7th Fleet, he said that China's got to be challenged. We've got a responsibility. We, the US, the policemen of the world, we've got the responsibility to check and challenge China in the South China Sea. You had, is it Mike Minahan, this four-star US general, who said in this, this memo a few months ago that he thought that the US would be fighting China within the next two years, so by 2025. And the US clearly believes that it will benefit from an armed conflict that China will be weakened, or in a best case scenario, as I said, there's regime change. So what's Wang Yi saying to, to ASEAN? He's saying, look, the US is, this is what the US is doing. It's trying to involve all of you in this conflict. It's looking to reach into its Ukraine playbook. And that's not gonna work in any of your interests. Even for the US's close allies in Europe, is Ukraine working out for them? <laughs> it's not working out at all. Ukraine's dealing with a massive crisis. It's teetering on the brink of recession. And the most immediate cause of that, as I was saying earlier, is precisely that these countries have been forced to committing uh, economic suicide by the US. So Wang Yi is saying to ASEAN, to the countries of Southeast Asia, this is not what you want. This is not good for you. It's not good for us. It's literally not good for anyone in the world other than a tiny handful of elite imperialists in the United States of America. Before I get to you, Ken, because uh, I definitely want you to respond, I remember uh, uh, the NBC, they did a nightly news 
report on what Mike Minahan said. It almost felt like they were trying to clean it up because they asked him any questions like, do you really believe this? And then he was trying to say, no, 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 I don't. I, I, I'm not trying to scare anyone. We're not trying to be provocative with China. And then at the end, the reporter says, are you ready to for conflict with China? He's like, oh, we're getting ready. Like, it just it blows them. Like, that's just how these people are talking about China. And it's backed up with action. But uh, Ken, I want to for anything you want to react to what Carlos said. You. Well, I, I think that that you know the the situation, uh, the military situation, or the the risk of of outright military conflict between the United States and China is is very real, uh, and it's very dangerous, uh, and it would be devastating uh, basically for everybody. Uh, obviously, if if some sort of conflict were to break out involving uh, the island of Taiwan. Um, there would be devastation in Taiwan. I'm sure there would be damage in adjacent parts of the mainland. Uh, but the economic damage would would extend around the world. Uh, you know, it would be massively destructive of, of the American economy, uh, which, of course, is deeply linked because of its central role in the global capitalist system to almost everybody else. Uh, countries like like Japan have said that they would maybe jump in on a war like that, well, they're going to have massive damage. It would be devastating. It's not in anybody's rational interest for a war uh, like this to take place. But looking at it historically, uh, it was it was insane for the first world war to take place. You know, we, we understand it as an inter-imperialist rivalry in that instance. And it didn't make any sense, uh, you know, for them. And yet they couldn't help themselves because they they structured their way uh, into a, a, a situation that they, they simply couldn't think their way out of. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, all this posturing, all this this uh, uh, adventurous rhetoric that gets spouted uh, by by politicians on both sides of the, the you know, the, the aisle, as they say in, in, in Congress, um, is it's reckless and dangerous and and it, it's largely produced for domestic consumption but uh, you know it, it has real world implications and uh you know it's talking about painting yourself into a corner uh, they're they're they make it uh increasingly difficult for china to to understand what's going on you know to to take anything that american you know leaders or politicians say very serious because of very seriously because of this back and forth um, where they, you know, they, they say one thing that sounds really bad and then, oh, they maybe backpedal a little bit or somebody else says something that's meant to be more conciliatory, but then they turn right around again. How, how, how is China to have a, a reasonable understanding of what the actual direction of American policy is? What they can look at is, is what America has been doing and what America has been doing has been to engage in endless provocations provocations of sending, you know, violating the agreements that we have with the Chinese government by sending all these weapons, by sending military trainers, by bringing Taiwanese troops over here uh, for training, by these provocations uh, in, in the South China Sea, uh, by these spy flights that, that we routinely, uh, you know, run up and down the coast. Uh, it, you know, it, it, actions speak louder than words, although the words are bad enough, the actions are even worse. And I think that that China, you know, China's preparing for this. China has to be ready. Uh, Carlos is absolutely right. Uh, you know, about about China's policies have been consistent. China has always said that the re, you know the resolution of the Taiwan situation is a matter for the Chinese on both sides of the strait to work out in their own way in their own time without outside interference. Uh, they're not saying, you know, we're setting a deadline and if things don't get set by that time, we're going to invade. And, you know, they don't they're not going to say that because they don't need to say that they're not, they don't need to do that. Taiwan is part of China. The same American politicians who purport to be, you know, backing up uh, the, the, the war in, in Ukraine on the on the principle of, you know, the sanctity of, of sovereignty and territorial integrity turn around and in the very next breath completely throw that out the window uh, by saying that, uh, you know, that we're going to defend Taiwan uh, you know, against what? Against, you know, the rest of the country or the rest of its own country. You know, the United States, of course, the bloodiest war in American history 
was a war to prevent secession. It was a war to prevent the separation of part of the country from the rest of the country, the American Civil War. You know, that's something that the United States has deep in its history, you know, and yet most Americans, if you if you proposed that analogy to them, they have been so relentlessly indoctrinated about the situation in Taiwan that that, that they just they, they can't see that as as being a relevant uh, case, you know, but we find ourselves in a situation where where the risk of actual military conflict, I think, is is real and is serious and is only getting worse. The Biden administration has been much worse about this than than the Trump administration. Trump was a lot of bluster and a lot of silliness in one way or another. But, uh, you know, the Biden administration, uh, these these I mean, he's a, an octogenarian cold warrior and just can't break out of that. But he seems to have surrounded himself with uh, people like Blinken and Sullivan and others that, that, that are equally locked in to this mentality. And they can't recognize that the kinds of changes taking place, not just in China, but in the world. Again, Carlos, you're absolutely right. This isn't, it's, it's multipolarity. It's a polycentric world. It's not, even if they could, even if they could somehow stop China, what about the rest of the world? You know, the rest of the world is going in, in similar directions. It's just the old monopoly on modern industrial technology that the West held for a long time. That's long gone. It's long over. And this new growth, this new development around the world is that's that's what's that's what's happening. And and China is at the forefront of that, but it's not it's not an isolated case, which is what makes kind of this version of the Cold War and, and this, this risky version of a hot war, so different. It's, it's different from the old Cold War and it's different from the conflict in Ukraine because, you know, Russia defending itself against NATO expansionism, you know, has done very well in terms of, you know, escaping the intended consequences of American sanctions. But Russia has a lot of challenges. Its economy is not that big. It's not that powerful. Um, and yet they're able to, to stand up for, you know, protecting themselves from, from NATO expansion. China is, is infinitely, well, may not infinitely, but dramatically more capable, economically more powerful, militarily, you know, right at the, at the leading edge of a lot of developments. It would be insane. You know, the, 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 the Pentagon gamers must understand that they could not successfully defeat China. Uh, and that what would happen would be just massive destruction on both sides. And who wants that? Who thinks that would be a reasonable thing? No one in their right mind. But the question remains whether the people who are leading us down that path are in fact, you know, doing so in any kind of rational calculation other than the most vapid, short-term, self-interested political maneuvering. Yeah, and the RAND Corporation, the Center for New American Security, all of these hawk, war hawk think tanks backed by the Defense Department, they all have predicted that exact outcome, that any kind of hot conflict, even if they want to whisper out the side of their mouth that they'll win it, whatever that's supposed to mean, uh, there will be massive destruction, not just between the two sides, but uh, globally as well. I mean, the world economy would essentially... <laughs> Uh, go bye-bye in such a conflict. But I wanted to know maybe in terms of this uh, multipolar world and what both of you have referenced um, in, you know, in your points so far, uh, there is, I think, a, a perfect example going on right now that uh, encapsulates this tension between the U.S.-led unipolar world in this China-led and Russia-led multipolar world. And that is the G20 summit, which is happening very soon in India. Uh, China has decided not to go. Xi Jinping is not going to attend in person. And Vladimir Putin had long said he is not going to go either. Now, Joe Biden has expressed uh, disappointment, he is saying. And after all of what both of you have covered so thoroughly and, and cover so thoroughly in your work, uh, it it seems like it shouldn't be so surprising. But I'm wondering if you could talk about, because at the same time that 
China, Xi Jinping, Russia, Vladimir Putin, they're not going to go to the G20 in person. Uh, they have committed to, and Putin himself has committed to going to the BRI forum, which is happening in October, the Belt and Road Initiative forum. And you mentioned BRICS expansion. Um, and I'm wondering if you both could talk about how does China's uh, uh, maybe disappointment to Biden not attending the G20 kind of fit into this changing world, this multipolar world that includes the Belt and Road Initiative, the expansion of BRICS and so many other multilateral mechanisms. Carlos, I'll let you begin. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just on the G20 quickly, like I am i don't consider this to be like a major snub that Xi Jinping isn't going, uh, isn't going to attend in New Delhi. Um, you can't attend everything. He's just been to the G20 summit. The premier is going, Li Chiang is going. So, you know, there's very high level representation from China at the G20. Um, but, you know, and, and Biden says he's disappointed that he's not going to have a bilateral with Xi there. But, you know, Xi Jinping doesn't owe Joe Biden anything, frankly. <laughs> and, um, you know, what's actually Biden from New Delhi, he's flying off to Vietnam to try and draw Hanoi into the U.S. camp against China. So we know what his agenda is. Um, you know, like wh whatever they say about wanting better relations with China, well, sanctions stay escalating. There's talk of expanding AUKUS. Just a couple of weeks ago or last week, there were new sanctions announced on China on utterly spurious grounds about putative human rights abuses in Tibet. Um, they're allowing Taiwanese leaders to have bilateral meetings with top US officials. Frankly, you know, as I said, I just it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Chinese have just decided that Biden's simply not a man of his word and not someone that's really worth making a whole lot of effort for. And like the US is going into election season. No doubt it's going to be fought again to a significant degree on the basis of who can be the biggest and who can be the loudest when it comes to anti-China rhetoric and when it comes to China bashing. So I think it kind of makes sense for China to focus on positive diplomacy with serious partners who who mean what they say and do what they say. And BRICS being a prime example of that, or the BRI Forum being a prime example of that. You referenced, Danny, the, B, the BRICS Summit. Obviously, that was a huge success. Uh, it hasn't received a huge amount of coverage in the Western press, it has to be said, basically because they're salty about the whole thing. But, you know, I, I think what we've really seen is that BRICS is becoming kind of the voice of the developing world and, and the sort of flagship institution of the multipolar process, which is why you've got so many countries applying to join. And, and there was a comment a couple of days ago by the Bolivian foreign minister, Rogelio Maita, who said, we in Bolivia, we're looking to the future and the future is BRICS. And you had something similar from Daniel Ortega, I think it was yesterday, um, uh, president of Nicaragua, who said, look, BRICS is the leader of the multipolar world. BRICS is where people are coming together. They're uniting for peace. They're uniting against poverty. They're uniting uh, to protect the environment, to defend against climate breakdown, and so on. So BRICS has got this, uh, this, this kind of trajectory, and it's got this momentum behind it. Obviously, the big headline story from the summit is the expansion. And that is really big news. You know, people have been talking about BRICS expansion for a long time. China's really been the leader in, in pushing that expansion process. And yeah, having Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, it just it adds a lot of break, uh, a lot of weight to BRICS. You know, it means that BRICS countries will now, or as of the 1st of January, account for nearly half the global population, nearly 40% of global GDP, and an awful lot of the world's energy production. Um, more countries are, are likely to join in the near future. Venezuela is obviously like it's an obvious candidate. Turkey is a very obvious candidate. And so significant that both Iran and Saudi Arabia have been invited to, to join. You know, obviously both are major energy producers. It adds a lot of economic weight to BRICS. Um, but also just the fact that these countries for 40 years have been mortal enemies. Of course, we, we saw in recent months, China was leading 
uh, on, on facilitating the rapprochement between the two countries. But it really highlights that you know, BRICS is acting as a kind of as a unifying force for the countries of the global south. And, and the Iran and Saudi, like they're sufficiently invested in the whole project that they can, you know, they can live with jointly occupying that space. Um, it also indicates a very interesting and what could prove to be historically momentous um, shift in Saudi foreign policy away from being this kind of dumb, unthinking proxy of US imperialism, which is not, you know, which is not to say that the Saudis have suddenly got some kind of socialist or anti-imperialist religion, but you know, I don't think it's an ideological matter on their part, but it's a question of self-interest in the context of the overall momentum of global politics, the relative decline of the US, the rise of Russia, the rise of China, um, you know, with US hegemony becoming a thing of the past, it's in the Saudis' interest to have good relations with China, with Russia, and with other major countries, including Iran. Um, Ethiopia joining BRICS. I don't know about you guys, you know, for me, like being the age I am, like, I remember, um, you know, being a kid in the 1980s, at a time when Ethiopia was really like this byword for poverty, it was a byword for famine. And there was this racist, like basket case narrative that totally ignored the West's role in impoverishing Africa, both in the colonial era and the neo-colonial era. Um, but it's very moving now to see Ethiopia modernizing, to see Ethiopia developing and joining the ranks of, you know, dynamic emerging com countries. It's Africa's second most populous country. It's been enjoying this rapid development in spite of, it has to say, uh, it has to be said, like decades of destabilization uh, orchestrated by the United States. Um, and China's been a big part of facilitating that development. And that's another thing that it really highlights the difference between China's approach to the developing world and the US's approach to the developing world. The US and the former colonial powers in Europe have been imposing underdevelopment on these countries for decades and indeed centuries, whereas China's engagement is emblematic of their development, of their modernization, of their industrialization, of precisely breaking the back of underdevelopment. Um, another key thing that was was discussed, and maybe we'll talk about more, is this whole process of de-dollarization, trade in local currencies. I mean, realistically, I think the BRICS countries are likely too diverse politically, too diverse economically, to necessarily come up with a joint currency uh, that could challenge the dollar. But certainly, there was lots of discussion and serious discussion in Johannesburg about bilateral trade in local currencies rather than the US dollar. And that is, you know, that's part of this general trajectory towards breaking dollar hegemony. That's not going to happen overnight. You know, there, there are a few people on our side of things on the left uh, and anti-imperialists who imagine that breaking dollar hegemony is going to be a relatively easy and quick thing. Uh, you know, sorry to drop a spoiler on you. It's not going to be, it's not going to happen overnight. It may well take decades, but it's a project and it's a process that's in motion. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, all that. Those are all really good uh, uh, insights and, and, and reflections, Carlos. I think that um, I want to reiterate what you, what you said right at the beginning of that, which is to note that, you know, it, it, Xi Jinping may not be going to, to New Delhi, but China is going to be there. China is going to be there prominently. The, the, the prime minister, you know, Li Chang is going to be there. And so it's not as though they're snubbing, uh, this gathering, although the United States will always do, you know, whatever it can to make whatever China does to cast it in, in, in any possible negative light. So this kind of disingenuous uh, disappointment on the part of, of Biden is just that's that's so shallow and, and kind of fakey. But um, but I think that this this shift that's taking place, uh, the the multipolarity. One one thing that that you said, Carlos, that I I want to sort of pick up on a little bit, is is that it, multipolarity is it's also it's also it's very diverse. You know, uh, it isn't as though uh, uh, you know it's. I mean, back in the first Cold War, you know, there was this whole ideological division. You were either in the free world or you were in the, you know, the, the communist uh, bloc, as they used to call it. That's not what's happening. This isn't, you know, China's not out there crafting a new order, trying to put itself at the center of that. You know, China is part of a 
a process, a deep, and I've, I've said this a few times, I think already, this, this deep structural reconfiguration in the post, you know, Western monopoly era uh, as, as modern productive technologies first sort of got dispersed around the world initially with the Bolshevik revolution, but then with the decolonization. And now that, that a country like China is at the leading edge of creativity and innovation, um, you know, that genie is not going back in the bottle. This is, this is just, this is the way things are going to continue to develop. And China, I think does serve for, for many people around the world as a kind of model, as a kind of beacon of, of a very positive path to a more just and equitable and prosperous future that's also ecologically sustainable because all of those things are priorities for China in its, in its development. But that doesn't mean that, you know, China... We've talked about this in other contexts as well. China doesn't impose political conditions on its existence uh, and its engagement with other countries. You know, it, you know, Russia, uh, uh, admirable as as their efforts are to to be part of this process of getting away from American uh, hegemony and domination. Russia is not a socialist uh, state. It's not a socialist economy. India certainly is not. Uh, you know, any kind of socialist or, or even progressive uh, uh, economic system. Uh, but that's, that's not the point. It isn't that China wants to impose its system, its model on others. It will lead by example. It will, it will provide whatever assistance, uh, especially in that regard. I'm sure they would be delighted to assist other countries in moving in a, in a more socialist direction, but that's not something that they, that they impose on others. So it isn't, it really, it truly is a, a multipolarity, a diverse multipolarity. Uh, and that's really important because the United States, again, it can't conceive of that. You know, the United States, first, there's this self delusion in America that everybody in the world wants to be like us. Everybody in the world wants to be Americans. And that's, you know, even to the degree to which that was ever true, it's certainly not true anymore, right? And, and you know, that's something that, that I think especially uh, bourgeois politicians here, they just can't get through their heads. They think that, that unless a country is, the, the closer a country is to being exactly like the United States, a two-party electoral political system, you know, whatever the movies are showing in the theaters are made in Hollywood, you know, all these, everything they can think of, that's, that's what's good. And to the degree to which a country diverges from that and doesn't seek to ingratiate itself and accommodate itself into the American system, to that degree, that's bad, right? That kind of thinking is what makes it so hard for the United States to figure out how to get along in this changing world, you know, what we should be doing, what many, I think, American people, if they, if they thought seriously about it, would want us to be doing, is figuring out how to get together with these newly emerging centers of, of growth and development and innovation to solve the problems that we're all facing. We have these massive existential challenges. And, you know, sending John Kerry over for a meeting, that's great. They can have a productive discussion, although as soon as he gets back, not not John Kerry himself, but other politicians here blow that out of the water by making these reckless and irresponsible condemnations and criticisms of China. So, you know, the U.S. needs to get get its own house in order and needs to figure out a positive path in the world rather than just being, you know, we're going to we're going to circle the wagons and hang on to everything. And, and the last thing I'll, I'll say on that, on that particular uh, sort of theme is that when you look at the world, whether it's BRICS expansion or the BRI or any of these other uh, emerging situations, the reality is that, that you know, the rhetoric that gets spouted by Biden and others about how you know, the world has united behind Ukraine or united behind NATO or united behind America, it's just it, it's ridiculous. You know, I, I mean, I guess some people believe that still, but well over half the people in the world live in countries that have rejected, that have voted against the American resolutions at the United Nations, that have rejected participation in the sanctions regime. You know, it's just, that's just not. And, and again, you know, I don't know whether they're deeply self-delusional or just so committed to trying to hang on to things 
<clears throat> that American politicians seem unable to, to come to grips with a changing world. And that, of course, only means that we're getting left behind even more rapidly than we would be if we tried to be part of the part of the change rather than an obstacle to change. Yeah, maybe to close uh, your final comments on this, uh, the every time that China is accused of snubbing or uh, not doing its due diligence to, diplomatically uh, by the United States or the West, what ends up happening is you hear things like the EU now is pronouncing that it's going to take advantage of China's absence by uh, kind of s taking a high ground and working toward the African Union being uh, fully admitted as a uh, participant in the G20 uh, uh, mechanism. But at the same time, both of you have written and you both have these two books out. I mean, both of you write, have written a lot about and spoken a lot about how uh, not only is it something like the G20 itself so outmoded, but it's the difference between how China and the United States, China and Europe uh, co uh, treat African countries, countries in Latin America. Carlos, I know you wanted to talk about the China-Nicaragua free trade deal that just occurred. Uh, and both of you talked extensively about China-Africa relations. So uh, could you maybe dispel briefly this uh, notion that the Europe or the United States or, 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 or the West in general can take advantage of China's absence in anything, given that much of the world sees it a lot differently, sees the U.S. and Europe's kind of unipolar uh, approach to world affairs and development as being uh, damaging and disastrous. And I think that's one of the reasons why Xi Jinping doesn't want to go to the G20s. It's just not there. What, what point is there at this point? It's, it's, it hasn't really been useful for a while. And much of what the West participates in or leads hasn't been useful for quite some time. But uh, I'll kick it maybe back to you, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the the free trade agreement between China and Nicaragua, um, and I think that's that's a really good example of of, of the dynamic that you're talking about. Um, signed last week by uh, by both sides by Laureano Ortega, who is the presidential advisor um, to uh, Nicaraguan government, and Chinese commerce commerce minister Wang Wentao, and you know, Laureano talks about it as being like this is going to mark a before and an after for the Nicaraguan people, because it means more investment in Nicaragua, it means more jobs for Nicaraguans, more um, technology transfer from China to Nicaragua, it means more imports of goods, like more relatively advanced goods like computers, more exports to the Chinese market. So in terms of Nicaragua's development, um, to uh, tack on to a, to a point that Ken was making earlier about development, this is a really profound and really important thing, a great example of multipolarity, of win-win cooperation, of mutually beneficial relations. It's not an act of charity on either side. It's two countries coming together as equals to improve their respective situations. And, you know, it really it highlights the differences between China and the US and, and certainly gives lie to the idea of like Chinese imperialism and, and, and so-called debt trap diplomacy and things of that nature. You know, the, the Nicaraguans are very alive to the threat of imperialism and, and, and coercion. They're very alive to the reality, uh, the actually existing reality of how the US treats them, how the how Europe treats them. You know, they've dealt with it from the time of from from the time of the Sandinista revolution when 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 the Sandinistas took power back in 1979, like they faced a decade-long war that was basically orchestrated by the CIA and the State Department against the revolutionary government. Um, today, they continue to face brutal sanctions. They continue to face economic coercion. Uh, what do they get from the Chinese? They get dignified treatment. They get treated as equals. And they got an opportunity to upgrade their economy and improve living conditions for their people. So China invests, China loans, there's no structural adjustment programs, there's no like punitive loan conditions, there's no austerity, there's no forced privatization, there's no forced deregulation. And you know, that's that's China's engagement with the whole global south. Um, you know, uh, there's a quote from Hugo Chavez that I referenced in my book and that I've, I've, I've mentioned in a few, a few sessions, a few podcasts, a few speeches, but 
Chavez said, China's large, but it's not an empire. China doesn't trample on anyone. It doesn't invade anyone. It doesn't go around dropping bombs on anyone. So yeah, you know, China these days, it's a powerful country. It's got a huge economy in, in purchasing power parity terms. It's the biggest economy in the world. But its rise has never been on the basis of colonialism. It's never been on the basis of neo-colonialism, domination, hegemony. It's been on the basis of being a huge country, as we were uh, discussing earlier, being a socialist country, on the basis of having, has to be said, an exceptionally far-sighted leadership. And let's not forget an awful lot of extremely hard work by the Chinese people. That's nothing like imperialism. That's nothing like how Britain became rich. That's nothing like how the US became rich. You know, the US has engineered this entire world economy to work in the interests of American capital. And that's done via its unipolar world order. It's done via wars and proxy wars and destabilization and sanctions and dollar hegemony and economic coercion and structural adjustment and uh, forced privatization, uh, deregulation, every form of political pressure, every form of economic pressure. China doesn't do those things. China loans money, China invests, its loans come without conditionality. The interest rate, interestingly, in spite of all this talk of debt trap diplomacy, China's, uh, the export bank's interest rate is typically around half that of the major Western lenders. China's development banks show way more flexibility on repayment, way more flexibility on, on writing off debts. And again, like it's only the Western countries that accuse China of setting up debt traps. China lends to dozens of countries in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, and elsewhere. They're not the ones complaining about debt traps. It's the US complaining about debt traps. It's Britain, it's France, it's Germany. So, you know, it's like, much like the Xinjiang issue, like where it's only Western countries issuing these slanders, is very obviously a case of projection and propaganda. So I think as far as countries like Nicaragua, as far as countries like Ethiopia or Argentina or Egypt or other countries that we talked about with BRICS expansion, as far as the countries of Africa, Asia, Latin America, Caribbean, the Middle East, Pacific are concerned, you can see you've got these two models of international relations that are asserting themselves very prominently in the world today. There's the model of imperialism, of unilateralism, hegemonism, unipolarity, and that's the model that's being promoted and pushed very hard by the United States um, with an attempt to transfer its domina domination of the 20th century into the 21st century. The other model is uh, the model of multipolarity, the model of multilateralism, the, mod the model of international law, the model of adherence to and respect for the UN Charter, um, the model of friendship, non-interference, mutual benefit, and global cooperation to solve what Ken talked about earlier, like the existential crises um, that our planet and that our species faces in terms of climate change, in terms of pandemics, in terms of global poverty and in terms of the threat of nuclear war. Yeah, um, I don't have a lot to add to that. Uh, I would, uh, one one note, uh, uh, harking back to, to the question of Xi Jinping going to, to New Delhi, uh, I think uh, semi-seriously that, that he may simply want to deny uh, Joe Biden the opportunity for a photo op, uh, you know, that, that as part of this, this pattern, of trying to pretend that that you know the United States is trying to work towards a better relationship uh, with China, you know, you can imagine having get you know setting up some sort of photo op there. Here's Joe Biden shaking hands with Xi Jinping, uh, you know, to show that that he's willing to make he's willing to reach out and make the gesture. And now now Xi Jinping won't even show up, you know. But that's just obviously that, that would just be window dressing. That that wouldn't really be any substantive. Uh, uh, action in terms of, of changing the overall direction of American policy. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think, Carlos, what you've been saying about, about the multipolarity and, and now the, the new trade deal with, with Nicaragua, uh, these are, it, it's just part of, of this, this slow, but, but kind of inexorable process of, of transformation that, that, that the world is going through. And I think a lot of what we see, um, 
you know, Gramsci talks about uh, uh, at one point, he talks about what he calls ideological inversion, uh, which which really basically is the process of projecting onto the other the, the things that that you assume have to be the motivations for actions. So, you know, when American imperialism or, or, or you know, uh, European uh, former colonial powers, uh, when they look at the world around them, uh, those kinds of political leaders uh, embedded in that, in that historical political culture uh, project onto people all over the world exactly the same kind of motivations, exactly the same kind of cynicism and the same kind of manipulativeness that have been characteristic of, of, uh, of their own uh, conduct and their country's conduct in, in the past. And of course, uh, that's structured into the nature of the capitalist system. Capitalism is a, is a culture, it is a, a, a mechanism uh, of greed, of, of, of constant competition, of constantly trying to advance your issues, your agenda, your dominance in a market uh, against the, the interests of, of others, right? And, you know, so that's how they look at the world around them. And they turn around then and say, oh, if China is, uh, is loaning money to these poor countries, they don't talk about what the, what the details of that is. It's simply a matter of, well, they must be trying to get them into the debt trap because that's certainly what we've done historically. And, uh, and so China must be doing the same thing, even though, you know, they can't actually demonstrate that. Uh, you know, major, major studies, all, all many, many ma major studies of, of Africa and other parts of the world and, and, and finance consistently show that, that China is not, you know, trapping people in debt and that most countries that have problems with debt have problems with, with you know, the IMF, the World Bank, private funding from consortia of financial institutions in the United States or in Europe. You know, it, it's China's not the problem here, but American politicians and, and pundits can only think in those terms because that's that's what we do. And so, you know, we, we, we invert that ideologically and project it onto uh, onto the, the other, in this case, China, uh, as a way of, uh, you know, as just the only the only way that we can comprehend it or frame it in our own in our own thinking, in their own thinking. Yes. And now maybe to spend the last few minutes I have with you a transition to uh, Isabel Crook and uh, whoever would like to begin speak about her. You know, she died at the age of 108. She lived in China all of her life. She was born there, born in Chengdu. Uh, you know, she lived a remarkable life, married to David Crook, who was a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain. They did incredible things. They've been honored in China by Xi Jinping himself. And uh, she died August 20th of this year. And I'm wondering who would like to begin to just talk about her. Because we're talking about treating people as equals, treating countries as equals. I mean, it seems like her life and the life of her uh, husband as well were huge examples of what that would look like from uh, people who hail from or have roots in the the West, in the unipolar world order that's existed for the duration of their of their lives. So, uh, whoever would like to begin, maybe Carlos, if you want to begin on Isabel Crook. Sure. Um, you know, as you say, she passed away on twentieth of August, so a couple of weeks ago, at the incredible age of one hundred and seven in our counting system, 108 in the Chinese counting system. Um, actually, I was lucky enough to meet her son, Paul, in London a few days ago. Um, you know, as you say, she was Canadian, but she was born in Sichuan. She was the daughter of, of Canadian missionaries and someone who spent the vast majority of her life living in China, uh, you know, a lifelong supporter of the Chinese revolution and indeed a participant in, in, in the revolution. And she and her husband, David, wrote a very important book, 10 mile in this is it well worth well worth seeking out it's really um well it's it was written in the late 1940s about land reform in the liberated territories and it's it's part of the canon of like english language analysis of the chinese revolution really important book and you know you really get a feel 
for what it was like to be in a Chinese village where people are engaged in land reform and, and transforming their lives and, and taking power into their own hand. Um, having suffered under literally thousands of years of feudal oppression. Um, then she and her husband were both very much involved in setting up foreign language education in China. I think you could say that they were really kind of the, the leading instigators and, and progenitors of that to such an extent that a couple of years ago, as you referenced, Danny, she was awarded the Friendship Medal by Xi Jinping, which is, you know, it's China's highest order of honor. So it's a, it's a massive honor. And I just think... You know, Ken will probably have more to say on this, but I think for those of us that uh, from the West that study China and that are friends of China, you know, we owe Isabel uh, a, a huge amount, and, and I think we've got a responsibility to to honor her legacy and uphold her legacy. Yeah, I, I certainly share that that uh, sentiment. Uh, I was I was very fortunate uh, at at one point in the 1990s uh, to actually meet uh, Isabel Crook and uh, and and a number of other. Uh, lifelong uh, uh, foreign, you know, residents in China who dedicated themselves to the revolution, to the project of, of building socialism in China, who, you know, who, who lived through all of that sort of epic struggle and 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 the tumultuous uh, uh, efforts uh, and, and changes that that uh, China went through in the 20th century, uh, and and these are people that that uh, certainly I know all of us uh, share a great admiration for. Uh, their their dedication, their uh, you know their their persistence uh, in in holding true to to the you know to the cause. Xi Jinping likes to talk about uh, likes to remind people and and talk about how uh, you know the task the the great task is to is to fulfill the original mission of the revolution to to continue to transform the lives of the Chinese people to, to build socialism, not as some sort of ideological exercise, but as, as, you know, as the work of, of making a new China, building a new society, in a sense, creating new people uh, in that process. And Isabel Crook was someone who, who not a Chinese person by sort of genetic ancestry, threw herself wholeheartedly uh, into being in China, living in China, working for the Chinese people. Uh, and I think that uh, that her passing at, at such a wonderful, uh, after such a wonderful life uh, is something that uh, I'm really glad that we're, we're able to commemorate and, and, and salute here today. Yeah, and it's super important to remember people like Isabel Cook too, now that there is this huge... Uh, rising mccarthyism too i mean people are being attacked for uh just standing up uh for china sovereignty and you know people are being attacked just for having connections to china at all uh, i know i can i've had you on here to talk about the china initiative more than a year ago and of course carlos we've done a lot of work on this too so and remembering her example is is courageous because uh, a lot of her work passed through that first cold war era where the repression was uh just really i mean it was it was huge at that time and and i'm surely isolated her from uh maybe she didn't have any western roots so to speak but uh, uh certainly wouldn't be a popular person uh during that time as she was doing her work in china um but anyway, I wanted to maybe to close out our conversation. Do you two want to talk about your books? I know we didn't get to reference them too much, but they're in the video description um, before we end here. And um, I have a few announcements to get to uh, before I let you guys go. If Carlos, you wanted to begin, talk, maybe talk a little about your book and um, and then we can t uh, kick it to Ken to close. Um, yeah, maybe we can end there our conversation. For sure. Um, well, not wanting to sound arrogant, but they're two really excellent books. Uh, this is Ken's book, China's Revolution and the Quest for a Socialist Future. Excellent. It's come out a couple of months ago. Um, this is my book, The East is Still Red, uh, Chinese, Chinese Socialism in the 21st Century. Um, I mean, it's great that they came out at around the same time. And, you know, it's like, 
we've added very suddenly and significantly to the overall set of books in the English language about modern Chinese socialism that are actually favorable to the idea of it. Um, <laughs> you know, they also joined some other really interesting and really important books that have come out in 2023. You know, I'd say it's kind of proving to be a, an excellent year for revolutionary books. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen and perhaps read the the Sordo book, yep. um, Stalin, History and Critique of a Black Legend, which is really, really good. I'm just currently reading another Iskra, Iskra Press book, the Lunar and Goyen translation of the Vietnamese textbook on historical, um, on dialectical materialism. Um, Jay Sykes's book, Revolutionary Science of Marxism and Leninism. There's loads of great stuff coming out. So it's like a golden age of radical <laughs> literature. Um, you know, I think Ken and my books, like I would say they, you know, there, there are obviously similarities. There are obviously overlaps. Ken and I come from very much, the, you know, a very similar ideological stable. Um, and I think we both consider ourselves Marxist Leninists and we're both supporters of the Chinese revolution in all its stages, you know, from, from 1921 onwards, if you want to look at it like that. Um, but I think we also like, we cover different things in the books, like the two books complement each other. Like, I guess my book, I try to take a, a, a deep dive on two things, really. Firstly, this very contentious issue of is China really socialist? Can it? Can you really still be socialist when you've got billionaires and when you've got markets and when you've got McDonald's and when you've got you know so much inequality and so on? So I go into the structure of the economy, state versus private ownership, planning versus competition, like the role of Marxism in Chinese analysis, um, their their vision for a socialist future, the second centenary goal, and all the rest of it, and then. Obviously, China's accomplishments in poverty alleviation, which we've talked about earlier, in environmental protection, things that, you know, in, in my mind, would be impossible if China were just, a, you know, a regular capitalist country. And then the second thing that I really take a deep dive on is the issue of the new Cold War that we've been discussing for, for most of this program. Um, so, and, and Ken's book covers some different aspects to that, that and, and kind of where I sort of skate over things Ken goes into a bit more depth like mine really focuses on the period from 1978 you know I, I mentioned things that go before that but the focus is on trying to understand China in the period of reform like Ken's starting point is a lot earlier like it's more like 19 you know pro probably 1840 like it's the opium wars it's the century of humiliation which is extremely important historical context like you can't understand modern China if you don't understand, um, you know, the the collapse of the Qing dynasty, if you don't understand the Taiping rebellion and the Boxer rebellion and the attempts at the first uh, Republic of China, the May the 4th movement, the founding of the CPC, the United Fronts, the Kuomintang, the Long March, um, the Yunnan period and the Civil War and all of these things, like, they get a mention in my book, but Ken gives you a lot of detail. And, and in that sense, I think, like, there's another book, which is a classic, which is pretty difficult to, to get your hands on these days, called From Opium War to Liberation uh, by a guy called Israel Epstein, who was another foreign friend of the Chinese Revolution, which is a really lovely history um, of the Chinese Revolution between about 1840 and 1949. Ken kind of updates that and makes it uh, more accessible. But then Ken's book obviously has the virtue of continuing up until today, up until, you know, 2023. And then I think Ken also goes into a lot more detail on the two line struggle during the Mao Zedong period. Um, you know, the historical provenance of those ideas of reform and opening up and some of the controversies of the first three, three decades of socialist construction. And I think there's like a really interesting, really balanced discussion of some of the most more controversial periods like the socialist education movement, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and so on. So, you know, to my mind, they're both really useful. They're both really interesting books and, and could very well and very profitably be read alongside one another. Yeah, I certainly agree. Uh, I mean, Carlos, your book uh, <laughs> it does such a good job of, of going deep into the two, two sort of themes that you talked about, but really kind of presenting contemporary China, the China that we have now, uh, and, 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 and defending it on the basis of 
the the substantive reality of, of of building socialism there. And I think that that's that's so important in terms of defending China, in terms of situating China, uh, not just you know out out sort of in, in in for for any readers, but especially on the left. There are so many people uh, on the left who are you know who who are sincere leftists, sincere Marxists, or or revolutionaries, uh, activists, political activists. Who somehow or other, um, you know, have this very jaundiced view of uh, of China, and I think it's it's important, um, you know, within the broader context to specifically try to address uh, them and and specifically try to 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 you know sort of in a comradely way to to articulate you know our ideas, the ideas that I think all three of us here share uh, about the nature of of China today. And about the legitimacy of uh, of the the project on which they continue to to which they continue to pursue. Um, certainly, you know, as an academic, I, I like to I always tell people you can always tell an academic because whatever kind of question you ask them, the first thing they're going to say is, "Well, it's complicated." Uh, and so, my book is an effort uh, to to provide that that sort of historical depth that 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 helps to nuance our understanding of of things today that that you know uh, china you know the chinese revolution china today doesn't uh, as as chairman mao says didn't just drop from the sky you know but it grows out of historical experience and those historical experiences shape the way that it has come to be today uh, you know, uh, things didn't have to go uh, in, in exactly the way they did. But because of history, because, you know, I, I also like to say nothing is inevitable until it happens. Uh, but once it happens, you can go back and look and see how it is that that came about. And so, you know, my book is a little more of, a, of an effort to, to construct that backstory, in a sense, in a way that I hope is, uh, is accessible and, and comprehensible to people who don't have a lot of uh, a lot of either experience with China or, or certainly any kind of, you know, of training in, in, in that history itself. So I do, I think, I think they work very well together and that people who want to just get a basic understanding of, of both the history and the, and the present realities of China uh, would do well to, to, to read them both. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of, uh, of uh, having produced the, uh, you know, this work myself and, and, and I'm super proud of, of your contribution and, and the work that, uh, that, that you've published. And of course, uh, working with Danny uh, on this kind of stuff, this is the, these are the tasks that we need to, to continue to engage in if we want to have any, any hope of pushing back against the, the, the sort of relentless uh, campaigns of, of aggression and, and demonization that, that imperialism is so intent upon. Yes, yes. It's works like both of yours that help put the politics in geopolitics. Oftentimes this word is thrown around, but there's the <laughs> politics, there's the history, there's economy. Like we have to understand these things to really understand what's happening in the world today. And it goes from the, the global level to, to being able to understand the reality that is right in front of us. So definitely pick up those books. They're in the video description here. But with that said, uh, thanks so much to both of you for joining. I'm going to let you go. I know it's getting kind of late out where Carlos is. And so I'm going to let you guys go and get to some announcements. But thanks again so much for coming on. Pleasure to be here. Always good to talk with you guys. Thanks so much. All right. Bye, guys. Bye bye. See you soon. Yeah. All right, everyone, that was a really good conversation. I just have one brief announcement before I head out of here. Um, there is a stream. Uh, oh, there's the siren. As you can see, uh, the neighborhood is mad that the stream is about to end. But since I have um, a few of you here still, uh, 874 of you watching, thanks so much for tuning in today in this afternoon stream. I thought it was great. But this is not all you can get from me today. Actually, I am back on live at 9 p.m. Eastern. Yes, that's right. Two streams today. Uh, believe it or not, I, I, saw, I can't really believe it either. But two streams today. So definitely, it's already uh, live in terms of availability. You can hit that notification. I'll put the link also in the chat. I'm going to get to a lot more of these Ukraine developments because there are breaking Ukraine developments from Reznikov being uh, sacked, the defense minister, to the Challenger 2, the British Challenger 2 tank, 
uh, being destroyed on the battlefield. Also, I'm going to get deeper into this Taiwan troop madness, the G20 situation. So I'm going to be getting into many of these things a little more in depth. Uh, uh, so definitely uh, watch that tonight. I'll be back on with you at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. If you're in China or out east, uh, for a lot of you, it would be 9 a.m. the next following day. So you can wake up and get your breakfast to it. Uh, but yes, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern is when I will be back on. That video is live and uh, you can hit that notify me button on the video screen so uh, you can come when I begin. So yes, two streams tonight. It is hard to believe. I don't think there was any super chats today. I don't believe. Let me check it out. Uh, I usually like to shout them out before I go, but I do see some members here. I see Sherry uh, in the chat. Let me actually go to the YouTube chat because, uh, yes, I see Sherry member. Hi, hi, hi. And hello to all the moderators. Thanks so much for your contributions. Joe, I see where I see Desert Mantis. I see. So good to see all of you moderating, too. It's much appreciated. And of course, everyone watching, everyone in the chat, I really appreciate all of you. If you're a Patreon member, uh, there was a Patreon member who asked a question today of our guest. It ended up being one of the questions anyway. So. Um, they submitted a question that was one of the questions that I had for our guests about the tech war and sanctions. But that's one of the perks of becoming a Patreon member. So do consider becoming a member on Patreon at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You get to suggest guests, ask questions, suggest content, and the like. So Amun actually asked how Chan China manages to get around sanctions. So Amun, you can watch the first segment of this live stream uh, where we talk about how China was able to do it, how China was able to make these breakthroughs, okay? So with all that said, everyone, I think I am going to head out. I do have to get to some matters before the 9 p.m. stream. So it's going to be a whirlwind today. And I really look forward to seeing you in about seven hours or so, six and a half hours or so. All right, so thanks again, everyone who came today. And I will be back with you in about six and a half hours. But when you're leaving here, like the stream, hit the subscribe button, hit that notifications bell. And of course, consider becoming a member on Patreon. Substack and YouTube membership also has similar benefits to them. So if you prefer Substack, if you prefer YouTube membership, you can get these benefits too. Now, YouTube membership is a little more constricted in what they allow and offer. It's really emoji-based, and I just have not gotten into the emoji game. So apologies to those emoji fans. It has not happened as of yet. However, you can still uh, get early notifications, still submit questions. I do post there in the community first and foremost to give you that opportunity. And of course, there are one-time options. There's buy me a coffee, there's PayPal, there's other options too that you can uh, tap into to support this work. And so tonight I'll have more announcements to come. Yes, even more announcements as I shape out the month and get ready for what will be a short October when I head off to Vietnam. So anyway, salute to all of you. Really great to be with all of you. Thanks for making today's stream um, a, a good one. And thank you so much to, of course, Carlos and Ken for their time. And I will see you all again very soon, tonight. Be there, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Bye-bye.